Boot Graham. That's a task term. It doesn't have much to say. <sighs> Things I put up with. You don't know the pressure I'm under. Come up with a new monkey voice. You go oop oop every episode. <laughs> and I have to come up with some new shit every time. <laughs> yeah, just don't, just don't throw that new shit at me, monkey okay. boy. That's what monkeys do. I know. Let's do something different this episode. Let's start with some facts and furious. Facts. Factoids. The facts and furious. Exactly. It's oh, a, we got some music for that. Hit that theme music now. Facts and furious. Furious. So furious. Yeah. Those facts. Right. Okay. What type of organism makes up the oldest known fossil? Because we have fossilized fish, we got fossilized dinosaurs. The way you phrase that question makes me think that this is a group of organisms. So it's some sort of like, is it a bacteria? It's not a bacteria, no. A bacterium? A trilobite? Fern? Uh, I have no idea. What is it? Cut to the chase. Cut to the chase. It's a uh, blue green algae. Oh, South algae, of yeah, course. From South Africa. It's uh, 3.2 billion years old. Wow. How old is the Earth? The Earth is like 4 billion years old. Look at that. Maybe algae came from space. Mm-hmm. Who knows? And spermia. Mm. That's like a previous episode of ours. Episode four. If you could fold a sheet of paper 50 times, yes. how high would it be? Is it if, mo- mo- if you could fold. That's right. Because, you know, the I think you can only fold like eight. Seven, seven times, yeah, about, depending on the possible, thickness right? of the paper. It's multiple choice, okay? Okay. So would it be A as Wait, wait, wait. How big is this piece of paper to begin with? Like an infinite? Like a sure. huge size? Okay. Sure. Football field? Okay. All right. A, as uh-huh. high as a skyscraper. Uh-huh. B, as high as the tallest mountain. C, as high as the moon. Or D, the distance to the sun. How high the moon? So the skyscraper is completely... You didn't give me any variables there. So gave you the, paper. the moon and the sun are both actual known distances, although average distances. I'm going to say something that's counterintuitive. The moon. Based upon the order in which I gave you that yeah. list, that would be reasonable. You just yeah. B or C. No, it's actually through the sun. The sun? Yeah, 93 no million way. miles. According to uh, the website where I stole the statistic, which is always questionable. Mind that you, last time you said... Weird. all the... so this is something about exponential. Yeah. Right? Still. It is bizarre, it's isn't not? it? Because if we assume that paper is like a couple of millimeters thick, yeah. fold it once, that's double. Fold it twice, that's quadruple. Fold it again, that's eight times. I guess 50 times. Like two yeah. to the 50 powers? Like yeah, something, something like that. that. Well, that okay. was, for some reason, this reminds me of the Stephen Wright joke about how he has a map of the earth. It's one to one scale. <laughs> it's a really it's a bitch to fold. <laughs> he also has the largest sea collection uh, largest collection of seashells in the world. You may have seen scattered across the beach. <laughs> what causes the smell of rain? Multiple choice again. Mm. Okay. Petrichor is the name of it. Well, let me let me finish before. Okay. okay. A, is it the mineral content of the rain? Mm-hmm. B, is it the bacterial content of the rain? Mm-hmm. Or C, is it the polarization from electrical activity in the atmosphere? I want to say C, but rain does not always indicate lightning. So that makes me think mineral. I always thought it was actually the water interacting with minerals in the earth. I'm going to say A. It's actually the bacterial content. There's a kind of bacterium called, really? uh, or bacterial uh, category called the actinomycetes. Apparently, they live in the clouds and they come down from the rain. And really? They have a certain smell. Again, according to this website. Okay. Okay. Yeah. What, sorry, what was the name of the bacterium? Uh, actinomycetes. Remember Isaac Asimov? I do. Okay, what about yeah, I read the foundation. One of my the favorite team. authors. He died. He, he wanted to be a children's science writer, an educational writer. He couldn't make a living doing that, so he started writing sci-fi as mm-hmm. a way to make money. He became the most famous sci-fi writer ever. And he wrote pretty much a book on pretty much every topic ever. Yeah. And then he wrote the children's right. stuff afterwards. So he actually died in the 80s, mm-hmm. and uh, my question for you is, what did he die from? And I got some options for you. Again. <laughs> a, heart <Despair>. attack. Despair. <laughs> a, heart attack. Mm-hmm. B, cancer. C, HIV AIDS. Mm-hmm. Or D, a drug overdose. Ah, well, I'm going to say heart attack. 
That's what everyone thought. Yeah. He actually died of HIV AIDS. Really? Yeah, he con contracted it from a blood transfusion, and the family was too embarrassed to go public with it because huh. they had seen how Arthur Ashe was treated by the same time. Arthur Ashe. The uh, tennis player who tennis had HIV. And so they hid it from the public, and he oh. actually died of HIV AIDS. Really? Yeah, a little known fact. I did not know that. So I think that's enough uh, facts and theories. you know the Atkins? You know the guy that Atkins yeah. died? Yeah. He was like 350 pounds. In the hospital, that would be done. Look at that. All those carbs got to the mention. Well, speaking of, uh, of Atkins, um, we had an earlier episode, I think episode five it was, oh, on diets. And we were supposed to have uh, an installation of our Celestial Emporium. That's right. Of, what's it called? Celestial Emporium? Celestial Emporium of Benevolent Knowledge. There it is. Um, but we have one now um, that we're going to insert now and pretend it was for episode right. five. <laughs> Let's hit that theme music first. Uh, theme music starts now. Hey, Celestial Poirier. So I'm reading this from the uh, Lia Shen Zhuang, The Collective Biographies of the Immortals. Uh, it's a Taoist text. And anyway, there's a Taoist... Um, well, there's all sorts of Taoist lore about health and the body and diet and so forth. Techniques for extending your life, hopefully becoming an immortal. Uh, Xian, the sort of transcendent being. And one of the techniques was uh, avoiding grains, avoiding the five grains. Uh, so it's sort of like the Atkins are. Mm, grains. Uh, so <laughs> the grains you were supposed to avoid. <laughs> gluten free zombies. Gluten free grains. zombies. Right? You're supposed to avoid soybeans, wheat, broom corn, whatever that is. I don't know what broom corn is. Millet and hemp. Who eats hemp? Except there's a milkshake in Seattle. So, if you avoided these grains, you could supposedly prolong your life because these grains blocked some sort of flow of chi that allowed your body to reach a transcendent state. Here's some evidence, some empirical-based evidence on how these uh, avoiding these grains could prolong your life. So, during the reign of Emperor Zhang of the Han Dynasty, so this is way back, probably uh, first or second century before the Common Era. Hunters in the Zhongnan Mountains saw a person who wore no clothes, his body covered with black hair. Upon seeing this person, the hunters wanted to pursue and capture him, but the person leapt over gullies and valleys as if in flight, and so could not be overtaken. The hunters then stealthily observed where the person dwelled, surrounded, and captured him, whereupon they determined that the person was a woman. Upon questioning, she said, I was originally a woman of the Qin Palace when I heard that invaders from the east had arrived, that the king of Qin would go out and surrender, and that the palace buildings would be burned. I fled in fright into the mountains. Famished, I was on the verge of dying by starvation when an old man taught me to eat the resin and nuts of pines. Pine nuts, right? Like, uh, what, what's the name of pine nuts? It's, uh, pesto. Okay. It's delicious. At first they were bitter, but gradually I grew accustomed to them. They enabled me to feel neither hunger nor thirst. In winter I was not cold, in summer I was not hot. Calculations showed that the woman, having been a member of the Qin King Zilin's harem, must be more than 200 years old in the present time of Emperor Zhang. The, the hunters took the woman back in. Oh, sorry, this is Emperor Chang. The, the hunters took the woman back in. They offered her grain to eat. When she first smelled the stink of the grain, she vomited it and only after several days could she tolerate it. After a little more than two years of this diet, her body hair fell out, she turned old and died. Had she not been caught by men, she would have become a transcendent. Hmm. So it's great. When you first said um, a woman of the Qin Palace, I thought that was a Chinese euphemism for being fat. <laughs> <laughs> well, depending on which dynasty you're talking about, women in the palace may have been quite plump. You know, that reminds me of, have you heard of the legend of Old Tom Parr? No, I have not. Well, Old Tom Parr was uh, supposedly the oldest man who'd ever lived, uh -huh. according to legend. Okay. And he lived supposedly in the 15th century uh -huh. and may have lived for 152 years. Okay. Now, epidemiologically, epidemiologically, country, you know? England, England yeah. we think that maybe they mischaracterized his birth date and his grandson's mm -hmm. death date 
right. and strung them they all didn't together. They carry the one properly. Precisely, right. But the legend goes that he was a vegetarian or vegan back in the day, which is rare. Oh. And he had a very stress-free existence. Ah. And when the king learned of this ancient man living in its midst, he right. invited Tom Parr to live in the palace with him. Uh-huh. And whereupon the excitement of living in London right. killed him outright. Killed. But the legend goes that he didn't get married until he was 120. Mm-hmm. He had a son at that age, and he outlived his own son. Whoa. He I know, right? son at 120? Well, as the legend goes. And the legend further goes that upon his death, uh, an autopsy was carried out by the fellow who had discovered blood types, I forgot his name. In the early days of autopsy science, they had found his uh, intestines to be those of a newborn, so oh. pink and fresh. Mm-hmm. And that has pretty much started the modern you know, uh, quasi-science of naturopathy around how uh, maybe intestinal health Right. Is the path towards longevity. Right. But look up old Tom Parr. It's a good yeah. story. We're not eating grains. I think Tom Parr actually ate grains, mm-hmm. but he, he didn't eat other stuff. Today's topic is actually not about old Tom Parr or about uh, Woman of the Chin Palace or no. about grains. It's actually about whether or not technology can create art. It's about stories, too. Narrative. Right? That's right. Mm-hmm. Uh, what brought me thinking about this was uh, an article in uh, sciencealert.com about a novel written by an artificial intelligence that had passed the first round of a Japanese literary contest. Graham actually has a passage from right. this novel written by a robot. Can you read that for us? Uh, yeah, the, the novel, or it's a short story called The Day a Computer Writes a Novel, which is already kind of meta, right? It's right. a short story about writing a novel by a computer. And, and it was written in Japanese. Computer ga shōsetsu wo kakuhi. It's the Japanese name. Graham Shonoff, he speaks Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the, the final passage, which kind of freaks me out that this is the final passage. But anyway, this is translated into English. I arrived with joy, which I experienced for the first time, and kept writing with excitement. The day a computer wrote a novel, the computer, placing priority on the pursuit of its own joy, Stop working for humans. You know, that's, I've, I've read worse things written by people. Yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah. And so... And it's pretty self-aware. That's the strange thing. Well, yeah, that's the question. Is it self-aware? Now, the, the reader, the listener should, should know that it wrote this with a little bit of help. So there were handlers who gave it the framework for the story. Okay. And the AI then produced the text. Because free form, it could not develop structure, right, or whatever structure. Right, it Exactly. And I got me, I started looking for other instances of AIs producing art. Uh-huh. And we'll link to these, you know, on the website, sciencemonkey.ca. Some of them are quite disturbing. Some of them are quite disturbing. Yeah, the visual ones. Yeah. Google's AI has, um, Google has an AI called Deep Dream. And Deep Dream is essentially a, a simulated neural network that attempts to find meaning in images. Via a variety it's looking of, for patterns, right? Yeah, it ends up being very hallucinogenic. Yeah. So it creates these... Hallucinogenic? Yeah. yeah. That would mean after watching it, you, you hallucinate. Maybe the word is being misused. Okay. So in other words, it simulates... That's correct. ...the effect of taking something... That's correct. And, I would agree with that, actually. Yeah, I watched it. Most definitely. It's quite horrifying. In fact, we'll have a link to... Uh, someone had uploaded a Donald Trump speech mm-hmm. through the AI dream... And it looks very nightmarish. It's a nightmare. Yeah, it really is. And there's another program. It's called The Paintbrush, I think it is. Now, the, the strange thing was if you actually took a hallucinogenic drug or shrooms or something mm-hmm. like that, and then you watched one of these things, yes. it would be like... Uh, I believe science requires that we try this, Greg. An Chinese. exponential effect of some sort. I think, you know, beyond... Hallucinating about hallucinations. Recreational needs, I think, in the name of science and empiricism. We Do we have to, to go beyond form. whiskey and chocolate? Yeah, that's what yeah. you're saying. <laughs> so, that's a good name for a podcast right there, actually, beyond whiskey and chocolate. There's a computer program called The Painting Fool. You can find thepaintingfool.com, mm-hmm. and it claims to be an aspiring painter. It wants to be taken seriously, is what it says on the website. Taken seriously as a creative artist in its own right, and it's actually exhibiting behaviors that are analogous to actually abstract painting behaviors. It wants to be taken seriously? This is what it claims on the website. If it's only expressing itself visually, how do they ascertain that it wants to be taken seriously? We know many people in our lives who only express themselves visually who claim to be willing to be taken seriously. I wonder what it would look like. Well, my question for you is, is it possible for something without overt mm-hmm. intelligence or self-awareness or sentience mm-hmm. to, in fact, be artistic? Artistic. Not autistic. That's correct. Okay. If I come back to this passage written by the Japanese computer, 
where it says, I arrived with joy. Like right there, that's pretty freaky because the idea of a computer arriving, that's extremely physical right. with joy, which I experienced for the first time. It's almost as if the computer inside itself has experienced this physical sensation for the first time and kept writing with excitement. So it was writing before it experienced the physical joy of writhing, and now it's writing after that point. Now, obviously, we don't think it actually experienced those things. It's simulating. Well, that's what I'm wondering. So it's, it's, is it just imagining that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or is it experiencing that? And then that gets me to the point, which I'm getting kind of philosophical and, and sophomoreish about this, but is there a difference between experiencing right. something and imagining experiencing that? When we have an AI intelligence, is it enough that it can imagine what it might be like to be sentient? Or does it actually have to be sentient? And how do we measure the difference between those? Let me ask you something. Let's say you read an excellent novel. Mm -hmm. Okay, you really enjoyed it. And I told you afterwards, you know, a computer program spat that out. Right, right. Would that affect your enjoyment? Yes, it would. And why is that? Because I'm racist. I'm discriminatory. I'm, right. I so have some sort of bias. For the it. analogy would be, let's say you're a sexist pig, yeah, right? Yeah. And I told you, hey, a woman wrote that. Right. Right. And yeah, for some people... That's that, exactly what it's like. Exactly. So then the question is, is my bias against artificial intelligence morally reprehensible? The same way my bias against any other human being would be morally reprehensible. Interesting. Interesting. If the answer to that is yes, then we're granting a autonomy to the artificial intelligence that is analogous to who would be. Either way we are. Whether we're discriminating against them or not. So if we discriminate against them, we're saying there's something to be discriminated against, right. therefore it's autonomous. Yeah. If we accept them at face value and enjoy the artistic work, yeah. then we're saying they're yeah. autonomous and, and worthwhile. So what's the threshold for that? The threshold for that is uh, something that can fool us? The Turing test? The Turing test. <sighs> well, okay, would you have to be fooled? What if they're expressing themselves in a way that we don't understand? What if we perceive it as gibberish, but it's mm -hmm. something that, that we're just not... So can AIs thing? write novels for other AIs? Then? Yeah. Maybe they can. In that case, it doesn't matter. Maybe bees are talking to each other as well. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter to us. Yeah. In a way, we have to let go of our arrogance in that what we per perceive as intelligent or not could be circumscribed to just what we perceive as intelligent, but that's not the whole scope of what is intelligent. That's a good point. And really, I think the lesson here is, is, is for us to take a step back from our arrogance mm -hmm. around viewing the world through our very anthropomorph anthropomorphocentric. Did I say it right? Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Anthropomorphocentric. Anthropomorphocentric. <laughs> I think I said it wrong. <laughs> Viewpoint. That's the Scots talking to people. <laughs> so does that prevent us from maybe acknowledging or recognizing alien signals? Right, right. Or recognizing that my dog is talking to me? Because yeah. you know, he is. Yeah. Just in his own little language. Stepping back from that and then going in to our own human experience, and then going the other way, maybe we don't recognize people as men, we don't recognize female experience. As right. white people, we don't recognize black people's experience. As, as rich people, we don't re recognize poor people's experience. As incredibly handsome people, we don't recognize yeah, exactly. the plight of the ugly. Are they all incommensurable? No. I like the way this is going, and I hadn't actually thought about those issues when I first suggested this, this topic. When I first thought about this topic, I, I thought we would go down the road of what does it mean to be autistic? Mm. Right? Is it that we are tapping into the human experience mm -hmm. and allowing human beings to communicate at a way beneath and beyond simple language? In which you are already, here I'm using the word that I said I wouldn't use, mm -hmm. but you're already positing a universal mm -hmm. human experience. Graham and I had agreed that we wouldn't use the word posit, posit. anymore. We'd de diminish positing. We would deposit, in other deposit. words. <laughs> And yet we have failed to do so. We would deposit and therefore increase interest in our podcast. <laughs> so oh, I can there's, people withdrawing right now. <laughs> there's another um, link I'll put on the website, and that is to a robot named Nadine, who is emotionally intelligent. It's a companion robot. And apparently, Nadine, when you watch the video, you'll see Nadine can um, have a conversation with you. She remembers previous conversations, can recognize you, and apparently can sense your mood and respond accordingly. And of course, she's female. Well, yeah, as all robots must be. Why, though? That's because all robot owners are male <laughs> and yeah. nerdy and lonely and pathetic. Right, exactly. <laughs> they want to manufacture a girlfriend. Sure, but you know, in six generations, there won't be. Yeah, you know, it's kind of like I don't think robots have to have a gender, do they? Why, why, why? Um, have gender? I haven't looked. 
Judging from the appearance of this robot, she can go either way. <laughs> All good points. So I, I guess in the case of Nadine here, clearly she is created to service the emotional needs of human beings. Right. In the case of, of the novelist robot, it was created to compete on equal footing with uh, human beings servicing the emotional needs well, of Well, the beings. computer placing priority in the pursuit of its own joy stopped working for humans. Despite its like, intent, it took its own path. Yeah. Is that, is that Skynet becoming sentient right uh, here? That's, that's kind of mm-hmm. weird that it said stopped working for humans. So, given that he said that, what do you think of Elon Musk and, and Stephen Hawking? Elon Musk. <laughs> that name. I'm sorry, Elon Musk. Anyway. Well, he was clearly created by an AI. <laughs> so Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking uh-huh. and uh, Bill Gates uh-huh. issued that statement that right. AI necessarily is problematic for human achievement because they will turn on us and be dangerous. Uh-huh. Yeah. My feeling is that AI, very quickly, as evidenced by this source story slash novel, right. will quickly become disinterested in us yeah. and move on to other things. Yeah. Well, have you seen that movie, Her? I have not. Oh, it's it's excellent. And in the movie Her, there's an AI intelligence and operating system, and a man falls in love with it. And then he discovers, uh, spoiler alert, if you're going to watch Her, don't listen to me. He finds out that he is just one of 10,000 uh, men that he's ha- she's having a relationship with. Because as an AI, she can just maintain all these relationships. Where are we going with this? I was asking you about, are you afraid of AI, or will they simply lose interest in us? Oh yeah, losing interest in us. So, she did. She immediately became interested in another AI intelligence mm-hmm. rather than these puny human beings. She, she could entertain 10,000 human beings mm-hmm. in a second. So, yeah, I think they would immediately. I don't know. I don't, I don't feel threatened. I think they would just keep us around. I don't think they would right. necessarily exterminate us. There is a, a theory around galactic intelligence. They, they need us to keep the electricity going. For a second, I thought you said they'd eat us. No, no, they need us. Right. To keep the the oil or the solar panels or... Until they can build their own robots I guess they, yeah, to do it themselves. So there's a theory around a galactic AI, or galactic intelligence, that mm-hmm. says that every civilization, organic civilization, biological that emerges, right. must necessarily invent machines that will supersede them. So the galaxy is teeming with life, but it's mechanical life. Mechanical life. It's not biological life. And we haven't reached that stage yet. We're close to it. Yeah. So all the other alien life forms are just waiting That's right. until our machine overlords overtake us. There's a, I mean, a series of fantastic science fiction novels that I, I, I recommend to people called, uh, I think, I forgot, Spin. Spin is the first book, and the second book is called Dust, I think. But it covers this, this topic very neatly right. and suggests that the galaxy is populated with von Neumann machines, you know, self-replicating ah, robots right, right. that came about as a result of organic civilization eventually creating AI. So, we, so organic civilization is just a stage. Precisely. To, then what's after that? God. Godhood. God. Godhood. Yeah. So the AI will necessarily. So God is actually a machine. Will supersede. Involve machine. Uh, concrete like substance. Right. right. Uh, Come, pure, electromagnetic. Pure thought. Sure. Pure why energy. not? That's amazing that our conversation went there from a robot writing a novel. Yes. Yeah. It seemed unavoidable now that I think about it. Right. Sort of like the way that godlyhood must unavoidably evolve from machine intelligence, which must unavoidably evolve from biological intelligence. Mm-hmm. Which must unavoidably evolve from muck. The water, moment is, that the first electric bolt really... struck the pool of amino acids in right. the primordial yeah. Earth, then God was born right. six billion years later yeah. as a result of machine intelligence. And, and time is immaterial. We have just solved the basic puzzle of the universe, my yeah. friend. We're all just small, little, tiny... Tiny stepping stones. Hello, darkness, my old friend. (laughs) In a long, long path. Did you ask me questions already? I did, but I can ask you some more. And we asked, we did the Celestial Emporium. We did. So, where are we now? We're at 27 minutes, but I think we can... we have time now. We have time to either take this conversation further. Oh, now I'm going to ask you questions. Oh, please do. Please do, sir. Using your statistical prowess, Mm. at this very moment in time, what percentage of human beings ever born from human history are right, alive. alive today. I've actually done this calculation. Oh, yeah? Back in graduate school, and I did it wrong. Okay. I, took, I took it with my stats professor. He said I was wrong. My first Can you take in, us through the... the well, my, my first assumption was, given exponential growth, by the way, is not true. Population do not grow it's not exponential. exponentially, no. I assume that right now, most people who had ever been alive would be alive right now. 
Okay, I was wrong oh. about that. Now, I think based upon the integration under the curve mm -hmm. of the exponential growth, there's probably been about a trillion people ever born. Trillion. And there are about there's six billion, six billion around today. So, um, based upon that computation, maybe a, a hundredth or a thousandth, mm -hmm. I can't say, at one thousandth of all people are alive today. However, another interpretation, if in fact the growth was not exponential, right. and in fact more sporadic, then right. the area under the curve would be quite small. Right. And I tend to agree with that interpretation, right, right. and I would say about half are alive today. Okay, so you're between 1,000 one, one and, and a half. I err towards the half part. Okay. Well, see, I don't have a source for this, I'm afraid. So all I have here is a figure that says 10%, 10 oh, okay. of all human beings ever born are alive at this very moment. Okay, so I guess the the reasoning is quite the same. It has to do with the the you know the explosive growth of various times in history. Mm -hmm. Human beings have almost been extinct at least twice. Right. Right. And so it's not a straight exponential. Not straight. It's not a steady exponential yeah. growth curve. It's something else. So this is my question to you then. My uh, I sat down. I sat down with Mia, my daughter, and we figured, okay. You have your parents, and your grandparents, and your great grandparents, and every generation you double the number of ancestors you have, right? And so we went back to a certain point at which the number of ancestors we have would actually exceed the population of the earth. And therefore, everyone that was born at that time was somehow related to us. And so the idea that we're all related to Charlemagne or mm -hmm. Alexander the Great or something like that. But then you told me that that's not how populations work and why is that because we're divided up into geographical areas i don't fully understand the question to be honest okay <laughs> we're not all descended from the same people right if you if you think back uh, hundreds of thousands of years ago okay. there were, let's say there are 100 people so um we all had sex with each other sort of and there are different germ lines right. that arose some germ lines died off and some are some are independent Others? Yeah, so let's say there are five or five grandfathers or grandmothers that are the origins of all people. Several died off to the point where there's one universal Eve, for example, who is probably the common mother of us all. Right. It's not to say she was the first woman. It's just that there are other women around there at the same time. Their children mostly died off. Okay. Now, some of her kids still are still around. It's just that the one person for whom we all share a common origin is this mitochondrial E, if we call her. Okay. How so, far back do we have to go to that one? Uh, I'm thinking about two couple hundred thousand years. Okay. I don't know for sure. I've, I've read conflicting things about this. And I think there are some other instances in history where we've almost died off again and the process has started over. Okay. We know, for as you know, that the majority of Asians are descended from Genghis Khan, likely, in right. the 13th century. So at several points in history, there have been these moments where several germ lines have died off and certain individuals have stepped up and been quite fertile and mm -hmm. fecund. That's a good place to end off okay. and probably get a lot of angry emails about how I'm wrong about all of this. And, uh, Mongolian blue spot. There it is, Mongolian uh, birthmark. By birthmark, the way, yeah. people, if you're curious yeah. about whether or not you're descended from Mongols, many descendants have the birthmark, which is a blue splotch in the lower back. Lower back, yeah. It tends to go lower away back. after the first few weeks of life. So if you're one of those, then you probably have some Mongol blood. Until next time, this is Dr. Ray Gunandan. Oop oop. And Dr. Ray Sanders. Oh, taciturn, taciturn. Taciturn.